This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Two years ago this week, on March 23rd, Connecticut Governor Ned Lamont ordered residents to stay home as COVID cases climbed in our state and eventually across the nation. Today, the government's approach to the pandemic is markedly different than those early months because of the availability of the COVID vaccine and certain treatments. But the pandemic isn't over, even if we want it to be. There are some 7 million immunocompromised Americans and many more who are at risk for severe illness and death from COVID. The CDC recognizes people with any type of disability that makes it more difficult to do certain activities or interact with the world around them as high risk. You might be talking about your neighbors, your family members, or friends. Coming up where we live, we hear from Disability Rights Connecticut about what needs to change so the most vulnerable are not forgotten in the pandemic's next phase. And later, Ed Young, the Atlantic's Pulitzer Prize-winning science journalist, joins us. With nearly one million American deaths to COVID, he asks, how did this many deaths become normal? You can join us, 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. You can share a comment on our Facebook page or find us on Twitter at Where We Live. First with us is a public health expert. Greg Gonzalez is a Yale epidemiologist who continues to raise concerns over how policymakers respond to the pandemic. He's an associate professor of epidemiology at Yale School of Public Health. Greg, welcome back to the show. Thanks. As I mentioned, you've been outspoken about the federal response since the start of the pandemic. I believe as early as April 2020, you said it was greater than a 9-11 level failure. So can you tell us about where your focus and frustrations lie today, two years later? So um, nobody's going to probably contest the idea that our response to the pandemic in 2020 was Um, unmitigatingly awful. Um, It was full of misinformation, incompetence, um, uh, and, and, you know, more than malign neglect. I think there was really, really um, such a failure of of the White House and the federal government to act that we we saw so many deaths that could have been avoided. Um, That's why we have higher deaths uh, during the pandemic than the rest of our peer nations. When President Biden took office, um, many of us were hopeful. His plan was comprehensive. It seemed like it um, uh, was turning the corner in terms of the sort of um, mistakes of the Trump administration. But by the time we got to last summer, um, there seemed to be a failure of will. Um, and um, and indeed, since the president's been elected, we've seen more people die of COVID-19 than did in 2020 uh, when we didn't even have vaccines. Um, and um, the president, uh, his previous COVID czar said they see no need to change the plan, that vaccination is the core of their um, COVID-19 effort, masks, rapid tests, um, a whole host of other uh, sort of interventions we might use are, are being left on the table, underutilized. Uh, meanwhile, we're under-vaccinated, under-boosted in this country. Um, we just came out of the Omicron wave and we may see a new wave Uh, coming soon. So we're desperately unprepared for the next crisis. Mm. When you mentioned the Biden administration uh, and when we think about the guidance that came from the CDC just a a month or so ago about uh, not having to wear indoor masks, uh, Ed Young will be on with us later in the hour, but with his reporting, thinking about that guidance coming out when 1,000 people had been dying of COVID every day for six plus months. And when we think about the shift to individualism, when we think about public health, you know, why this is so concerning, Greg? Well, first of all, when they announced the guidance, 2,000 people were dying per day um, and had been for weeks. Um, we're, we're not even down to 1,000 per day in the United States, um, uh, uh, even though they like to call this a lull or, or the time to sort of um, let people relax. The, the point is, is that I think the... Um, Biden administration sees the pandemic as box office poison going into the midterms. And therefore, you know, its pollsters and its advisors said downplay the epidemic at all costs. So the CDC has put out new guidance, um, which if you look on their website, um, you'll see a, a, a sea of green across the United States, really saying we're at the lowest level of risk um, and people can take off their masks in greater than 90 percent of the country. If you just simply search their website for their maps from last year, you'll see a sea of yellow and red in that um, there's still places with pretty high community transmission across the country, which put people at risk. Um, Remember, we have many, many under fives. uh, We have most under five children 
unvaccinated. We have millions of people who are living with disabilities and are immunocompromised who may not have responded to the vaccines. We have people who have not been able to get the vaccines for whatever reason or chosen not to get un- chosen not to get vaccinated or at high risk of death and disease. Remember, we lost 150,000 plus people over the past three months in the United States. Um, that is not the sign of a, a, a benign, mild uh, variant. It's the sign of a, a, of a public health catastrophe and a public health failure. When we think about, again, the White House, uh, just a few days ago, Dr. Ashish Jha uh, announced will be the White House's new coronavirus response coordinator. So what's your take on and his role to guide the Biden administration in this next phase of the pandemic? Because as you alluded, you know, cases are rising. This uh, B, uh, this this variant uh, of Omicron, uh, looking at cases rising in Europe and Asia while protections in our country are lax. Well, I'm very hopeful that Dr. Jha, as a, a medical and public health professional, is going to um, shake some sense into the West Wing. Um, he's going to have proximity to the president and Ron Klain and others in the White House. And, and they need to stop um, playing political games with the pandemic. Yes, everybody is tired and exhausted. Um, but saying that it's up to you to protect yourself um, in the next year that we that we may see wave after wave hit our shores is, is just irresponsible. It puts the burden on the immunocompromised, the disabled, the unvaccinated, and it also takes the public out of public health. Public health is a collective responsibility. Um, and the idea that vaccination uh, vaccination only is the main go-to strategy for, for the Biden administration makes no sense. It's in conflict with its own plan from, from January, 2021. So I'm hoping Dr. Jock can shake some sense into the White House and tell him, uh, the, the the unvarnished truth about the risks and how to mit- mitigate them and not just sort of feed them what they want to hear. When we talk about the immunocompromised population in our country, as well as people with disabilities, that they're high risk of um, if they were to contract COVID, um, thinking about some of the protections that were in place that are no longer, uh, of course, everyone looks to masks. But if you could broaden that and talk about you know, other uh, strategies that public health was using uh, to track this virus that are also, uh, again, uh, it's problematic when we think about, as you say, so many people want to return to normal, but we're not there yet. No, and normal is what made us vulnerable in the first place. We had a weak public health system, bare, you know, really feeble social protections compared to our, our industrialized nation peers. But, you know, everybody's talked about the Swiss cheese model of, of disease mitigation, and it's not just masks. Mm-hmm. Um, first of all, we can make masks available. N95 should be readily available um, to every American household so that people don't have to go searching around for them. Rapid tests uh, also need to be available. I know they were sending out a couple of boxes to us by the U.S. Postal Service. I got mine, um, you know, sometime towards the end of February, even though I had ordered them uh, on the day that the program um, went live. Um, we should be upgrading ventilations in schools. Um, we should get the Congress to pass the new COVID relief bill, which only had a modest amount of new COVID money in it. Um, and we need to deal with vaccination around the world. So there's lots of things on our plate that we can do that are that are far from mandating masks or mandating vaccines. There's stuff we can do that's, that's, that's easy, um, low threshold, but the White House seems to have no interest in it. You're hearing Greg Gonzalez here on Where We Live. He's an associate professor of epidemiology at Yale School of Public Health. As we talk about this next phase in the pandemic, uh, Greg, you'd mentioned, again, uh, the new BA2 subvariant. And when we think about even metrics that we should be watching uh, in this potential next wave, what did you want to share with our listeners? Well, the new CDC guidance is relying on hospitals and hospitalizations to be the trigger to, to set up alarm bells around the country. It's a lagging indicator. If a case happens today, it's maybe a week, maybe 10 days before they show up in a hospital. So we've lost, you know, over a week, two weeks, um, once the once the, the map that CDC has on its website starts to turn to yellow or even turn to red. Um, so we need a way to, to, to get on the ball earlier. Some of that is, is through looking at cases per 100,000, um, but we're not testing very much. And a lot of tests may be at home rapid tests. So we, we really don't have a very robust surveillance infrastructure in the United States. Um, some, some jurisdictions, many in Connecticut, have wastewater surveillance and, and can, can look at that as a, a marker of potential um, increases in, in, in viral circulation in the community. Um, but we need to sort of um, also just look beyond our own shores and see what's happening in Europe and Asia 
to to know that um, we may be uh, late to the BA two game, but you know it, it is here. It is rising in terms of its penetration into the the proportion of cases that that um, uh, it's responsible for. And we got to be ready for 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 um, seeing a wave that's going to potentially inundate our, our hospitals. We don't know how it's going to play out here. There have been many sort of iterations of the BA one BA two phenomenon. Some of some countries have have had uh, less of a crisis with both. Some have had one or the other sort of overwhelm their health systems. The best thing to do is to be prepared, um, both as individuals, both as a state in Connecticut, um, and, as a, and as, a, as a country, and make sure that we're ready for this um, should it start to peak over the next two to three weeks. But I fear that um, we've let down our guards um, and we are looking towards um, a, a return to normal, even if normal is, is months, maybe years away. You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. Coming up, we're going to be talking uh, with a woman who's with uh, Disability Rights Connecticut when we think about all of the Americans that are high risk and how, you know, in this, again, uh, this emphasis for many of us, we want to return to normal. But the fact that so many of these people have had to stay in their homes. And again, when we think about deaths, um, some nearly one million uh, in in this country, uh, the fact that, uh, you know, it just seems like there's not a lot of care uh, in what's happening in this population uh, or the fact that uh, one million and nearly dead, but nine million Americans still grieving, Greg. Uh, uh, when we think about that collectively, you know, what's your what's your opinion? So we've had close to a million deaths, right? And many of them are avoidable. And, and you know, there's many terms that um, have been used to describe death by public policy, social murder, structural violence. Um, these were largely um, deaths that could have been avoided, not in totality, um, but we did not have to have the worst uh, death rates compared to our uh, industrialized nation peers across the world. We just simply didn't. Um, and as you said, for every person who dies from the pandemic, we have nine people grieve, not nine people grieving. So we have nine million people at least grieving. Think of all the kids without caretakers, without uh, parents without somebody at home to take care of, and we have we have a new generation of of COVID orphans across the United States, um, and this is the this is the price of the sort of rush to normal. I want to go back to normal. Um, I want to I want to go back to doing what I did in 2019, but I, I, I I'm not going to do it through wishful thinking uh, and putting the the crisis behind us in the in the current moment because it's more convenient convenient for me, uh, more comfortable for me, uh, as I sit at home talking to you. Mm. At the top of the show, I mentioned uh, the government's uh, response now, very different from, of course, those early months. We know there is the COVID vaccine, uh, but there are still disparities in who's been uh, getting the vaccine and being boosted. Also, the the treatments that have uh, been developed um, and the question about accessibility, uh, NPR reporting uh, just the other month, I believe it's Evusheld, which is an antibody treatment uh, to help those uh, where the vaccine doesn't respond uh, to help build antibodies. Antibodies. And so where does that stand in terms of access to those treatments, Greg? So remember, you know, we have, um, we're an underboosted. We have about 29% of the people in the United States boosted. And remember, boosting is essential for, for protection against Omicron. Um, so we have not many, we have underboosted population of an undervaxed population. And then we're saying, you know, we can rely on treatments um, uh, uh, for people to, to fill in the gaps for those who are unvaccinated or don't respond to vaccinations, but they're in short supply, mm -hmm. right? And you need to know people, you need to know where people are at risk in order to, to be able to offer them the, these therapeutic interventions. It means testing out in the community, um, understanding where they are uh, and, and, and making these treatments available to them. Right now, we have a shortage of, of, of access to these treatments. Um, they're quite expensive and um, it, it's not gonna be uh, the most, um, easy way to deal with a pandemic. You prevent first, you treat later. Uh, when we think about your perspective uh, in public health and the infrastructure that this country needs uh, to continue to respond to the pandemics of the future, can you talk about uh, some of the, the work that you're doing as well as uh, the students that you're guiding in public health? And you know the fact that are we ever going to get there where we're definitely funding uh, public health uh, to avoid what we saw two years ago, Greg? So a couple of things. One is our students last May put out a report uh, on the sort of crisis in public health funding and put out some interesting ideas about how we might 
build up public health funding both at the federal level and at the state and local level. And it's available on the Global Health Justice Partnerships website at the Yale Law School. Um, but my colleague, Amy Kopchinski from Yale Law School, and I have been talking about something broader, something called a, a new politics of care. You know, when, every time we talk about going back to normal, we have to ask us if normal got us into this mess in the first place. And we've had a sort of fractured healthcare system, a weak public safety net, uh, weak social protections. And we were sitting ducks for this pandemic because normal was not good enough in terms of disease prevention and, 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 and health in the United States. And so we can deal with the funding crisis. Um, CDC is woefully underfunded and has been for years. Local state health departments in the same boat. But we need a much more full-scale sort of um, uh, soul-searching in the United States about why we were so vulnerable in the first place to this pandemic um, when other countries were able to roll with the punches a little bit better than we did. Looking to the future, we don't have a crystal ball, but we can see how these other waves have uh, moved in other continents. And then, of course, uh, back uh, in our country, uh, Greg. But when we think about uh, this next month, and are you concerned that if there is a need again uh, for much of the public to return to indoor mask mandates, what that'll mean for people who, again, have made this uh, a polarizing issue versus uh, uh, interdependent. Uh, we all rely on each other uh, to stay uh, safe. Well, you know, the way I think about it, we hope for the best and we plan for the worst. Um, but what seems to be happening in the United States is that we hope for the best and that's it, right? We don't make any plans for, for any eventualities that might confront our best wishes. So, Look, we don't know what's going to happen over the next few weeks with BA2. Um, we don't know what's in store for us this summer, this fall, this coming winter. Um, you know, the, the point is we can't give up, right? The virus is, doesn't care how we feel about masking or feel about um, vaccination cards or feel about um, uh, the, the state of the pandemic. We have to minimize the, the social and economic um, um, catastrophe that's that that this pandemic has brought upon many American families but we also can't turn uh, our, our eyes away from uh, the, the things we can do to keep each other safe keep our community safe keep our country safe um, so it's been a hard two years um, you know there's no way of getting out of it except through it which means dealing with the social impact of, of the pandemic and all the mitigation efforts we've had to make but also taking prevention seriously and realizing that Nobody wants to catch COVID uh, and you can prevent it. We can prevent it as a, as a, as a community, as a society, as a country, uh, if we invest in the right things. Again, you've been hearing Greg Gonzalez here on Where We Live, Associate Professor of Epidemiology at Yale School of Public Health. Always a pleasure to hear from you. Thanks for your time today. Thanks. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Coming up after the break, we hear from Disability Rights Connecticut about this phase of the pandemic. And later, Ed Young, a science writer for The Atlantic, joins us. What questions do you have? You can join us too, 888-720-9677. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. You've likely seen or read this number. Nearly 7 million Americans are immunocompromised, but they aren't the only ones at risk of serious illness from COVID. The CDC says some people are at increased risk of getting very sick or dying from COVID-19 because of where they live or work or because they can't get health care. This includes many people from racial and ethnic minority groups and people with disabilities. And COVID will likely increase the number of people we're talking about. Laura Malden, a Yukon sociologist and researcher focusing on disability, highlighted this stat in a recent Hearst op-ed, quote, the American Academy of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation estimates that long COVID will add as many as 22 million individuals to the U.S. population of a disabled people. Joining us now on Zoom is Kaylee Hill, who's a writer and advocate for Disability Rights Connecticut. She's based in Waterbury. Kaylee, welcome to our show. Hi, Lucy. Thank you. I understand you uh, began advocating for Disability Rights Connecticut about a year ago. And so tell us about your work and, and why you got involved. 
Yeah, well, I joined Disability Rights Connecticut. Um, I sort of was advocating myself um, before then uh, because I myself am disabled and immunocompromised. Um, and it was just, it felt like the right thing to do, the right place to be in terms of the work that is important to me and what I enjoy doing, which is, you know, advocating for people with disabilities. Mm. Uh, you mentioned that you're immunocompromised and also uh, have a disability. You've been documenting this focus on the, quote, return to normal on your blog. You're a person with rheumatoid arthritis and also Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. And so tell us what frustrates you personally at this phase in the pandemic uh, when there's so much emphasis on, on individualism. What frustrates me is that it ignores the entirety of the population that cannot return to normal right now. Immunocompromised people, and by the way, I'm so glad that you've brought up that it, you know, high risk is more than just immunocompromised people, um, because that's such an important thing <laughs> to state. Um, but immunocompromised people, and I believe Greg said this as well, we don't know for sure how the vaccine has affected us. We have been told and this is, you know, talking to the community, we have been told to essentially act like we aren't vaccinated, even when we are. And that means, you know, staying away from indoor places where there are a lot of unmasked people, which, you know, is very difficult to do now. What has the life been like for you the last two years, Kaylee, if you don't mind me asking? It's been interesting. Um, it definitely a lot of time inside and a lot of anger mm -hmm. <laughs> that I've had to work through over the past two years. Um, you know, growing up, being a sick person, um, I was diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis in infancy. So it's something that, you know, I dealt with even through swine flu in, what was that, 2009. Um, so I have become very adjusted to the attitudes that people have towards people with disabilities, but it has, I've definitely seen it reach new heights mm. during the pandemic. I was thinking about those early months where so many of us uh, were isolated and there was so much attention on why that's not good for anyone. Uh, but now when we think about the, the certain amount of the population that had access to a vaccine, and it does work within their their body to develop uh, antibodies, and this ability to go back to work or to go in a store uh, and not worry about uh, serious illness from COVID, uh, but that's not something that you and others can do. And is that where the anger uh, rests, is that this is a population that uh, society wants to just not think about? Yeah, <laughs> um, 100%. Um, it's, it's the, the pass, the passiveness of it. <laughs> um, they, the general population, um, definitely seems to I mean, in a way, I, I understand the fact that people do want to, you know, quote, go back to normal. But I guess it is that dissonance of not recognizing the other people who can't do that and how their actions affect those people mm. that can get me a little heated. Mm. 
You tweeted that, I'm going to quote here, one of the morals to this story and that there are many is that everyone learns about disability and disability justice and theory at their own rates, even when they themselves are disabled. We all have learning to do constantly. I was not born with an MA in disability studies. I understand you do have that master's, but talk more about that disconnect and what you wanted to convey when you tweeted that. Yeah, I mean, especially thinking about the long COVID population and how we are going to see this huge influx of of people with disabilities. Um, And it's definitely as someone who grew up with a disability, it has been, um, I'm not sure if difficult is the right word. It's just definitely been interesting to watch people have this conversation, the people who will have this conversation, um, and how it, you know, a lot of people, the, the pandemic has been their first introduction into disability justice and advocating for people with disabilities. Um, You know, I've had many people online and offline talk about how this experience as non-disabled people has sort of opened their eyes, um, shifted their worldview a little bit and made them realize, you know, just made them think (laughs) about the vulnerable populations and how, you know, as you said, it could be your neighbor, it could be your friend, it could be your coworker. You can join our conversation, 888-720-9677, as we talk with Kaylee Hill, who's an advocate for disability rights, Connecticut. She's also a writer based in Waterbury. As we talk about uh, people in our population who are high risk if they were to contract COVID. It's more than just immunocompromised people, but also people with disabilities. Uh, Kaylee, when we think about the way that uh, the pandemic has been messaged even in our state by policymakers, including Connecticut Governor Lamont. Do you feel like you've been heard at all? Personally, no. Um, no. <laughs> uh, I definitely think, you know, and a lot of it, it's this episode already has been really great because a lot of the the thoughts that I've had, you've already touched upon. Um, there's this hyper focus on the individualism and what people can individually do um, to protect themselves from COVID. But as we know, um, and as Greg said earlier, it, it doesn't work that way. <laughs> Um, We are an interdependent species. We rely on each other in society in a multitude of ways. And, you know, this is another situation where we have to come together as a community and protect the most vulnerable, which is a large population for COVID. Right. Uh, You've also studied the media, Kaylee. And so when we think again about this next phase of the pandemic, uh, what would you change about how the media is framing this? Um, I mean, I, I think framing it more as a community, um, how we have to form a, a collective solution to the pandemic. Um, and it, it won't be easy, of course, but I think we have to move away from the hyper individualism. And I think we also have to sort of steer away from having these conversations where we frame, you know, high risk people as, um, you know, only the frailest, sickest people, uh, you know, the 
tiny, tiny percentage of the population. It, it's, it's a lot larger than that. And um, we have to sort of come to terms with the fact that, you know, conditions such as ADHD or mental health disabilities like depression, um, and as you stated, you know, developmental disabilities, learning disabilities, all of these are high risk conditions um, for COVID-19, according to the CDC. And we really just have to realize that we're talking about a much larger population. And I really want the media to, and, and the public, <laughs> to think about when we have this conversation, whether or not the question they're really trying to ask is, well, how many deaths will we be comfortable with? Because a lot of the conversations have sort of revolved around that question. How many deaths will we be comfortable with moving forward as opposed to how can we try to continue reducing deaths moving forward? Kaylee Hill, again, is an advocate for Disability Rights Connecticut. You summed that up perfectly uh, for our next guest joining us uh, right after a short break. But we really thank you for coming on today, Kaylee. Thank you so much. You're listening to Where We Live on Connecticut Public Radio. Coming up, nearly one million Americans have died from COVID. But have we normalized their deaths in this rush to, quote, return to normal? Science journalist Ed Young from The Atlantic joins us with his perspective after reporting on the pandemic over the last two years. You can join us, too. 888-720-9677. That's 888-720-WMPR. Or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. This is where we live on Connecticut Public Radio. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. My next guest won a Pulitzer Prize for explanatory reporting for his work covering the pandemic. Ed Young is a science writer for The Atlantic, and he recently wrote a piece about this moment we're in, two years since the pandemic began. Young asks, how many deaths is society prepared to tolerate? And who are the people who will be impacted the most? He joins us now on the phone. Ed Young, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. You've spoken to many high-risk individuals over the course of your reporting in this pandemic. Recently, you spoke with NPR about the, quote, absurd joint stripping of precautions and funding. And so how is all of this exacerbated now by the BA2 variant? And should have we seen this coming, Ed? (laughs) Um, Yes. Um, I think that um, we keep on making the same mistakes over and over again. Um, I wrote a long time ago about the panic and neglect cycle in pandemic preparedness, where we um, enter a, a new epidemic emerges. We are underprepared for it. People panic. But then and once the crisis is over, um, neglect sets in attention, funding, resources, um, the political will to do something about it all quickly evaporate. And then we're left exactly where we started now. Everyone talks about this. This has gone on for decades. It's gone on in Democratic and Republican administrations. It goes on all over the world. But even against the historical standard, what we're seeing now is absolutely absurd because we are not over the crisis. We're still kind of in the middle of it. There's still very much a pandemic. And yet we're rushing back towards normal. We're pretending as if things aren't, aren't, um, uh, don't have the possibility of getting bad in the future. We're stripping um, funding from all kinds of important COVID measures, from testing, from treatments, from vaccination. And, you know, we're diving headlong into the neglect portion of it when there's still a crisis around us and when, as we've already heard, so many high-risk people are still at substantial risk. We keep hearing, and we've said this number too, 7 million immunocompromised Americans, but that's not also talking about Americans with disabilities. And so can you unpack that statistics when we're thinking about the amount of Americans who are considered high risk? Yeah, so 7 million refers to the people who are taking immunosuppressive drugs, 
for things like um, autoimmune disorders or um, to prevent them from rejecting um, uh, organ or, or stem cell transplants. It doesn't account for the people who might be immunocompromised because they have certain diseases that hamper the immune system like AIDS or a num at least 450 different genetic disorders. And it doesn't include people who are, have weaker immune systems just because of aging. You know, as we get older, our immunity gets weaker. Um, so I, you know, as we, we sort of heard, but it's always worth reiterating, this is a substantial number of people around us. A lot of them look visibly healthy. So you prob almost certainly do not know um, that. So you almost certainly have people in your life who are immunocompromised and you have no idea that they are. And that they aren't like just holed up in a bubble. Um, you know, they are part of society. They're all around us. They, they, you know, they want and they want to be all around us, right? All the immunocompromised people I've talked to, but none of them want permanent lockdowns. They want to get on with their lives. They want to be a part of society. But for that to happen, they need um, things to be safer than they currently are now. And they need accommodations that allow them to be um, the like the active normal parts of the world that they very much want to be. Um, I think there is this stereotype often that um, immunocompromised people are somehow holding the rest of the world back from returning to normal. I think it's exactly the opposite. I think the rest of the world in their rush to normal are dragging immunocompromised people back to a kind of um, a, a situation where their risk is still high and they're not comfortable with without any of the accommodations like um, masking or flexible working, um, you know, remote work and schooling options that helped them before with no consideration to the high residual risk that they are being asked to almost single handedly shoulder. You've also written about uh, when we think about this, uh, the general population wanting to get back to normal and how the damage is hidden from view. Can you, can you talk more about that, Ed? Yeah. Um, so I wrote about this in the context of um, the deaths that the U.S. has accumulated. You know, when, when we passed 100,000 recorded deaths, the New York Times on its front page called it an incalculable loss. And now as we're heading towards one million, well, what's 10 times incalculable? Why have we um, started to normalize to the sheer numbers of deaths we've seen? Why is it that we've had more than 1,000 deaths a day for almost half a year and at the same time, when we had like our fourth and fifth most um, deadliest months of the pandemic so far in January and February of this year, everyone was talking about returning to normal, about lifting restrictions. I think there are lots of different reasons. Um, you know, the virus is invisible. A lot of the ruin that it inflicts on people's lives are hidden from public view. It's obviously been two years and people are tired. We're also um, tired of just failing at this. I think failure be breeds fatalism and our continued inability to control the pandemic it makes people like throw up their hands and say, well, what, what am I supposed to do? But I think two of the most important factors here are that the pandemic has disproportionately hit some of the most marginalized people um, in our society, elderly people, immunocompromised people, poorer people in low income jobs, black and brown people, people whose deaths were often overlooked even before the pandemic happened and are now being marginalized in death, even as they um, tend to be in life. And while the while epidemics do tend to flow downwards into society's cracks, um, medical interventions rise upwards um, into its penthouses. So um, the most privileged people among us were among, the, uh, including many of those who work in the media and in policy making spheres were able to very quickly and very easily get vaccinated and then quickly decided apparently that um, everyone else was therefore safe. Um, and that discrepancy between the people who are most impacted by COVID and who continue to be most impacted by COVID and the ones who, um, are, who were, were um, safe and secure earliest and easiest, um, that gap is huge. And to me, accounts for a lot of why so many of our leaders and so many of the voices in the media moved past the pandemic or told everyone to move past, despite the substantial risks that many of us still face. 
You're hearing Ed Young here on Where We Live, science writer for The Atlantic, as we talk about the pandemic two years on and the fact that it is not over yet, although many people would hope that it is and are acting like it is, but that, again, puts at risk uh, so many Americans who are immunocompromised, also those with disabilities, the focus of our show today. You can join us if you have a question, 888-720-9677, or find us on Facebook and Twitter at Where We Live. We heard earlier from uh, Yale epidemiologist Greg Gonsalves about uh, the the dissonance, uh, the fact that also policymakers are paying more attention uh, at, at this point it seems to public opinion versus what public health experts are warning. And so I'm wondering if you can talk about that Ed, as we move into um, this next year. And again, everyone's looking at this variant and the cases rising in Europe and parts of Asia. Yeah, um, I think that um, um, I don't think that this is going to, that we have seen our last surge. Um, and I think that if we were smart, um, we would use the lull times, um, you know, not not just to like get the much needed, um, you know, t- time with our loved ones, um, a-, a chance to recuperate. Like individually, um, I do think that people should do that. But like policy wise, you know, for for the whole country, we need to use these times to strengthen our defences against future surges. And if not future surges, then certainly future variants, future viruses. This is not going to be in the next pandemic that hits us. Um, But we aren't doing that. We're sort of dismantling everything. COVID funding is going away, just as funding for past epidemics went away. Um, You know, testing is going down. Contact tracing is going down. Um, Our supplies of important medications that immunocompromised people um, have, you know, pinned their hopes on while everything else reverts back to normal. Those medications were always in short supply and will be in shorter supply. Um, So, you know, we are... We're we're just not getting ready. And that is truly shocking after two years of these cycles. Like it's it's just baffling to see how little we have learned. And you know, I want to point out that you, you talked about um how uh our policymakers seem to be paying attention to, to public opinion rather than what public health experts mm-hmm. are saying. Um I'm not even sure that's the case. I think they're sort of paying attention to this warped perception of what public opinion is. Like if you looked at the planning polls for the longest time over the pandemic, um, they supported very broad, like in, uh, they supported measures like mass mandates. They supported protections that kept people safe. Um, and that support often got lost amidst this idea that, Everyone hates these things. Everyone wants to get back to normal. Um, one study recently show, looked at a representative sample of Americans and gave them a choice between two post-COVID futures, like a back to normal option that was emphasizing economic recovery and this build back better option that was trying to reduce inequalities and create a more progressive future. And most people preferred the latter, the more progressive future one. But they also assumed wrongly that most other people wanted the return to normal and that that future was more likely. This is a thing called pluralistic ignorance, where people think that majority of these are actually minority ones and vice versa. And it happens often because of active distortion by politicians and by the media. Um, and I think that is what we have seen. And it's unfortunate because in, it means that by wrongly assuming that everyone wants to return to the status, previous status quo, we foreclose the option of building something better in its place. Mm. We hear about COVID fatigue. Do you have fatigue for being uh, one of the journalists who's helped us understand uh, this pandemic and uh, looking at uh, what the data show and, you know, seeing, as you mentioned, uh, this uh, warped sense that uh, some uh, policymakers are paying attention to at this point in the pandemic, Ed? Um, Yes, uh, I was... I was fatigued in the summer of 2020. I, I'm not sure there is a word for what I'm feeling right now. Um, but uh, put it this way, 
I interview a lot of people who are extremely burned out. I have talked to healthcare workers. I have talked to immunocompromised people. I've talked to people who are grieving loved ones that they lost over COVID. I've talked to long haulers who are still dealing with the symptoms um, that began, you know, for them months or even years ago. Um, a lot of these groups have just had enough they are worn thin they are stretched um stretched thin and i sympathize with that a lot um you know i, I think that the we have been we have been told and taught that the way to think about the pandemic is through the lens of individual risk analysis what is my risk right now and i think that is entirely wrong and deeply misleading. I think the question that animates the pandemic always has been and still is, who bears the risk that remains? Um, so I am thinking about the people who have been disproportionately harmed by COVID and continue to be disproportionately harmed. And the reason everyone should think about that and center policies on those groups is that those will be the same groups who will be harmed in future surges, future variants, future um, future pandemics, to the detriment of everyone. Like, the pandemic should have shown us that we are all deeply connected and in a profoundly unequal society where marginalized groups are left to fend for themselves, everyone suffers. Um, and so if we really want to get better at this, we, were, we ought to be taking a more um, a, a, a focus that is much more about reducing the risk of the people who bear the highest risk. I'm not sure that's what we're going to be doing. Um, and so my fatigue grows. But I'm glad that shows like this are shining a light on exactly that problem, because I think that we all need to pay attention to it. Mm. You've also done writing focusing on uh, some of the solutions, uh, you know, the fact that the pandemic has shown uh, that our system is unfair and unjust, uh, thinking about uh, ways uh, to make sure that uh, there is access for all to, to health care, even to help the poorest of individuals and the access to uh, antivirals and other treatments uh, as we move forward, Ed. Um, any last thoughts that you wanted to share with us? I would asked Greg earlier about this, this moment where there's now a new White House uh, uh, coronavirus uh, coordinator, Dr. Ajish Jha, um, and how um, thinking about the federal response in the hands of a public health expert, um, is this a, a good move as we move into this next phase? Um, well, I wish him well, um, but, uh, I, you know, I think that it's going to be a hard slog um, you know, d d despite appearances of country, like things seem quite good right now. I think there are further challenges ahead. And as I've said before, I think we are already barreling towards the next pandemic um, because we have made specific policy choices that have weakened our ability to handle pandemics in general. Um, I think there is a lot of rebuilding to be done. And I think it needs to focus on um, on. Uh, issues of inequity. I think if your focus is only on the richest areas, the most privileged areas, the areas with the most resources, um, we're going to we're going to fail again as a society. And I'm not sure we can afford to keep on doing that. At the very least, our um, our healthcare system cannot handle um, a, you know a, a future in which we keep on going through hospitalisation surges again and again. We need to get better at this, and we need to get better at it fast. And people have said for a long while, including our um, you know in, including Dr. Yar, we have the tools to deal with this pandemic. Well. I question whether we have them and whether we have them. Right. Um, I think that we actually, those tools certainly exist in the ether, but actually using them is going to be much more challenging. And Ed Young, thank you so much for your time, science writer for The Atlantic. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel, today's show produced by Katie Pellico.